Um, so, hello everyone. Welcome to the seventh event by the British Indian Surgical Association. Um, this is going to be on urological emergencies and it's kindly being um, presented by Dr. Serena Teneja. Uh, Dr. Teneja is an academic foundation doctor at the EBH Deanery. Her AFP involves working on her PG cert in medical education, as well as developing some undergraduate and postgraduate teaching programs. Um, Dr. Sanger is interested in pursuing a career in surgery and is considering specializing in breast surgery. Uh, for now, however, she is currently planning her F3 in Australia. So over to you, Dr. Sanger. Thank you. Yep, I think that pretty much sums it up. So hi, everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Serena and we'll be going through urological emergencies today. Um, it'll be quite interactive, ideally. So if you've just got your phone or a tab on your laptop or something, if you open up Poll Everywhere um, or just Google Poll Ev and it'll be the first link. And then um, as I ask you guys questions, they'll appear hopefully on your phone or on your um, window. And then we can have sort of live results and everything on the screen. So I'll just give you a couple of minutes to do that. I'll just be introducing things at the beginning anyway. So you can start opening that up while I do that. Any verbal questions or written questions, any way throughout the presentation, feel free to ask on the chat or just um, unmute and ask as well. I'm more than happy to answer them. And yeah, let's start then. So I'll just be briefly touching on anatomy, not spending long on it, and then going straight into the common urological emergencies. Now, I understand most, if not all of you are final years or towards the end of med school. Um, if that's wrong, let me know on the chat, but essentially I'll be aiming this as for final years basically and try and get you thinking as an F1, as a junior doctor in A&E or on the wards and how you would actually manage these things in front of you. Um, obviously I'll be including exam stuff as well like SBA questions um, and I know exams are important but would we'll be focusing a lot on the management and how to actually deal with the patient in front of you. So that's what we'll be doing and there'll be some standalone SBAs at the end as well but it'll be mainly integrated. So um, aims are to review your urological presentations, the acute ones. We'll talk a bit about catheters, imaging, and two week wait guidelines sort of intertwined throughout those cases. But the overall objective, like I said, is to know how to manage these emergencies when you're on call as a junior um, in a few months time. But like I said, any questions, please ask. So let's start with the um, general anatomy. One of the reasons I really like surgery and urology in particular is it's very visual, very simplistic, um, and you can always just go back to basics if you're ever struggling with the concept. So urology concerns this tube, essentially. It starts at the kidney, goes down to the ureters, into the bladder, and out through the urethra. Every presentation, every pathology is a problem with this tube. Um, it can cause pressure issues, it can cause obstruction, um, and you can think very logically about where the issue might be to then help you know how to manage it. So for that reason, I really like urology. Um, brief discussion on these two types of symptoms. So voiding symptoms and storage symptoms. Um, they can help you determine where the problem might be. If someone's coming to you with mainly voiding symptoms, we're thinking about problems with the prostate, essentially, things that are causing obstruction to the urine and the patient can't pass it as smoothly. So that's intermittent urinary stream, straining, hesitancy, incomplete emptying and terminal dribbling, which spells a nice mnemonic, which I can leave you to work out going down. And then storage symptoms are problems with actually storing the, symptom, uh, storing the urine in the bladder. And that's more to do with bladder pathology rather than prostate. These symptoms are really important to know because this is what patients come in usually into a GP setting with. Um, and so you know which ones to ask to determine what's going on. So yeah, here is the whole urinary tract and I've included a male urinary tract as well, just to include the prostate, which is obviously a really important source of pathology um, as we'll find out soon in urology. So case study one, a 67 year old man presents in A&E with generalized abdominal pain and has not been able to pass urine for the last nine hours. Now, just using the chat or unmuting, can someone tell me what the most important pertinent parts of this history are in terms of working out what's going on? 
Oh, in terms of the poll code, I've just seen on the um, chat someone's asking, it'll come up again in the next slide. So I will let you know when we get there. For everyone who wasn't here at the beginning, if you just open up poll everywhere um, or poll ev on your phone or on an internet browser, um, there'll be a space to enter the code so you can answer questions live. I'll let you know the code shortly. Um, yes, so someone's messaged me to say that the fact that this is an acute presentation, so the time frame, which is in the last nine hours, that's really, really important. There's one more thing that's really important in this history, really key, if anyone wants to point it out. Yep, age is good. It can give you an idea about what kind of pathologies are common in this age group. Males for sure, so they've got um, a lovely prostate which causes issues at this age. One more thing that's really important, if you're taking this referral on the phone um, or from a GP, this is the one thing you want to ask about if someone's not passing urine. There's not many words left to be honest. Is there anything else people can think of? Oh, just met some people. So the pain, okay, this generalized abdominal pain is really, really important thing to ask in the history. This is an acute scenario. Acute scenario is because of the time frame, but also because acute retention presents with very, um, sort of very painful pain. <laughs> and the patient will be really uncomfortable. And that helps you differentiate between chronic, um, chronic um, retention. So if you can see at the top of the slide, you can see my code, which is my name, Serena Teneja 350. If you type that in to where the box is um, and just start typing in questions, I'll do it alongside you just to make sure it's all working. So what are the possible causes of this presentation? In other words, what are possible causes of acute urinary retention? So I'll give you about 30 seconds. So good, cystitis or a UTI. Yeah, absolutely. So BPH is benign prostatic hyperplasia. UTI, good. Corduroquina, super important thing to rule out. And someone's mentioned that in the chat as well. Very important to exclude. Malignancy, obstruction. Okay, so obstruction can be caused by things like BPH or malignancy. Trauma, always. <laughs> any question in any surgical setting. Uh, the username for anyone asking is at the top of this slide um, where it says respond at Polev and the username is Serena Teneja 350. Might be a bit of a delay for when it loads up on your phone, but it should be there within a couple of seconds. Oh, is the username not coming up? Let me type it in onto the chat. Which is actually a good idea in case anyone wants to look at it later. Okay, so the username's in the chat as well. All right, I think that's a good selection of things. Anyone who didn't get to answer this time, don't worry, there's lots of, um, lots of chances to answer. So let's go to the next one. Okay, so we've talked about a lot of causes. I think most of these things came up. The most common cause in a gentleman of this age with this presentation would be prostate issues such as BPH. People mentioned infection. Um, we also had neurological things coming up like corduroquina. So urinary retention might be a presenting symptom of it. And hopefully you know the red flag questions to ask in that case, like fecal incontinence, saddle anesthesia, numbness and tingling in the legs. Really important one is constipation. You'll, I, because I did um, a geriatric placement at the beginning of the year, saw this all the time with people carrying like a liter in their bladders um, and they haven't passed stools for sort of days to even weeks. So that's really important to, thing to ask about. It's so easy to treat. And as we'll find out, the most important thing in terms of definitive management is to treat the underlying cause of the retention. So these are really common causes. Make sure to ask questions around these things. Phimosis, we will discuss um, briefly at the um, end of the lecture. Essentially, it's a problem with the foreskin, which can 
block the obstruct uh, block the outflow of urine, but we'll we'll see pictures a little bit later. Um, if anyone asks you a question about causes in a surgical setting, surgeons um, really, really like things to be categorized. And actually, I really like things to be categorized as well when I'm revising or recalling things um, in my head. So there's lots of different ways to categorize your answers. I think when it comes to any tubes, be it the gut um, or the urinary tract, thinking about it as luminal mural, which means within the wall itself, an extra mural, so outside the wall, is a really good way to think about these things. So essentially, if you're thinking about retention, you wanna know what's causing the obstruction. So within the lumen itself, it can be things like stones, blood clots, and of course, malignancy. Don't forget urethral strictures, which can sometimes happen after instrumentation of the tract um, or after some STIs, um, you can get things like after gonorrhea, you can get stricturing of the urethra. Sometimes it's congenital. So that's important, very important to ask about because you don't want to be putting catheters in these patients. Mural, so within the wall itself, again, malignancy, malignancy anywhere along this whole tract, so kidney, ureteric, or bladder. Um, and then extra mural, so things outside the actual urinary tract. Most importantly, the pelvis, um, the prostate, but of course it can be things like abdominal and pelvic masses as well. So, so luminal, mural, and extramural. So luminal means within the tube itself. Someone has asked what these things mean. Mural means within the wall and extramural means outside the wall. These are ways to categorize causes of obstruction when talking about a tube such as the urinary tract. Okay, so how would you assess this patient? So you're the F1, you've got this patient in front of you, writhing around in pain um, and saying he hasn't passed urine, what would you do? If people wanna say or type a few things, fabulous A to E assessment. I can tell you guys have been trained well <laughs> if this is the first thing you go to. Um, anything else sort of? Alongside that, yep, so catheter, we're talking about more sort of management, which obviously follows assessment. Bladder scan, incredible. Medications, yes, in the causes, there were some medications there, I didn't read them out, but generally anticholinergic medications um, are your big category of things that can cause urinary retention, really good. Bladder scan, for sure, if you can find one or if the nurses can find one, it's quite a commodity in most A&E departments. Um, yes, use an ease for sure when you're doing your bloods, creatinine, great. So we're thinking about the kidneys, okay? That's really important um, when it comes to acute urinary retention. As with any tube, if there's an obstruction downstream, then upstream there's going to be a lot of pressure and that's gonna cause issues um, when it comes to the kidneys. Yes to abdominal exam and yes to PR for two reasons. Of course, you wanna feel the prostate is it feeling big? Is it feeling malignant? Um, and also checking for constipation. So good. I think you guys have covered everything. So your A to E, including your abdo and PR history. I put here is obviously you need to ask lots of questions here, but specifically I put hematuria prior to retention. Why is that a really important question to ask in this history? Yes, so everyone who's written things have written things along the right lines. Yes, the hematuria could be caused by stones and bladder cancer, but the important thing in this history is to note that if they have been passing hematuria and now they've gone into retention, this could be clot retention, which we will talk about later, but it has a slightly different management. So it's a really important question to ask, okay? We will touch on this later. Bedside investigations, your urine dip to rule out things like uh, infection, bladder scan for obvious reasons, and bloods. You're looking for infection and you're looking for kidney damage. So immediate management, someone has mentioned catheterization. Yes, this person in front of you is going to be in a lot of pain. The bladder scan will probably show one litre, sometimes even more. Um, every time I've seen patients in front of me like this, you just, you're, you're wincing inside because you can just see how much pain they are in. 
And there is no better feeling as a doctor as when you get the catheter in and you see that instant relief. It's really, really satisfying. It's probably my favorite um, thing to do in A&E. Um, although that's a bit weird, but hopefully you get what I mean. Um, but it's just really, really satisfying. So yes, get your catheter kit. Um, any contraindications? So a Foley catheter, we will be talking about catheter shortly, but yes, a Foley catheter is most commonly used. Obviously, if there is a history of clots and hematuria, that's going to change. But for this situation, there are no clots or hematuria and you'll need your normal Foley catheter. Yes, and uh, I've got some contraindications coming through on the chat. So strictures, yes, ask about the history. Previous false passages. So essentially what a false passage is, is it could, it's usually from previous instrumentation or previous catheterization. When it goes sort of in, you're trying to go in through the urethra, but you accidentally come out somewhere else and haven't actually passed it into the bladder. This can happen with repeat catheterization or difficult catheterization when they've got a big prostate. And this is not a, not a good thing to do. So general rule, I would say just try once, twice tops and then contact urology or someone more experienced than you because you could do more damage than harm and urology will be very angry if you said you've had about five attempts and now you're calling them, okay? What must you document? Uh, I mean, after the catheterization, what must you document? Have you done any catheters in the wards or seen any juniors do them? Yes, good, so it comes with a sticker uh, on the back of the catheter. This is just an example I found online. They're all quite similar. Uh, you peel it off um, from the catheter and you put it in the notes and it actually has everything that you need to document, but it's good to know anyway, just in case you accidentally bin it, which I've pretty much done every single time. You need to write exactly what everyone's saying in the chat, when you inserted it and um, what type it is, how much water is in the balloon, really important because someone is hopefully going to take that catheter out one day. And if they take out 10 mils and you've actually put in 20 mils um, and they take out 10 mils and pull it, that's, that's not going to be fun for anyone. They're really important. Other things is to say how much residual there was, so how much drained immediately. We'll talk about why that is and whether there was any hematuria. Now this is really important, or, or rather what color the urine was. If it's red, um, ready, bloody at the time, we know that there was some hematuria pathology going on. If they develop hematuria a few days later and the urine was originally clear, we can almost certainly say that this is a traumatic, that the reason for hematuria is the catheter trauma and it will save the patient lots of unnecessary investigations and everyone panicking about blood in the urine. A little bit of blood is normal a few days later, but we need to know that it wasn't a baseline at the time of catheterization, okay? So these are all important things to put. Concerning features uh, in the history examination of catheterization, I think I've talked about hematuria already. Large residue and abnormal renal function in the bloods is, is concerning because um, there was a lot of, there's been a lot of urine inside the patient for a long time. And suddenly that's all passing out. And the kidneys are kind of in overdrive, producing more and more urine because none has been able to get out. So the kidneys think that more needs to be produced. So um, this, is, this can lead to something called post-obstructive diuresis. This is um, defined as massive release of urine after this acute relief of obstruction. Numerically, it's around more than 200 mils an hour for three hours or more than three liters in 24 hours. And this can cause a lot of issues for the kidneys because you're losing all your electrolytes, you're losing all that water and your kidneys are kind of working in overdrive, okay? So it's super important to therefore document how much has come out and keep a really strict input output chart to monitor how much the patient is losing, okay? So anytime you insert a catheter and lots of, and they're in acute retention, make sure you take um, note of these three things in terms of your management to make sure that you're safe as an F1. So withhold any nephrotoxic drugs. Can anyone give me any names of nephrotoxic drugs? Yes, <laughs> hopefully they're not on regular gentamicin once they come into you, but um, yeah, don't, don't, um, 
maybe maybe hold it. Uh, Ramapril, absolutely. And said metformin, brilliant, cool, good. Yes, there's some weird and wonderful ones like cyclo and lithium too. I always remember it um, as stop the damn drugs, just when I'm sort of busy in A&E and I just need to remember them quickly. Of course, now you can look them all up um, on the BNF on your phone, but these are really sort of obvious ones to know about um, and make sure you cross them off for a few days uh, if and when the patient's admitted. Monitor use and ease, we've already talked about that and fluid resuscitation is vital, okay? So the guidelines say that you should replace 50% of the hourly loss losses in normal saline. So what does that look like? So, okay. If people haven't logged on already to poll Ev, I'm just going to write my username again because people have been joining. Um, oh, no, I think I'm just message one person. <laughs> Sorry, um, Apana, I just DM'd you. <laughs> Uh, everyone in meeting, okay. Okay, hopefully everyone can see the username Serena Tanager 350 Hopefully it's at the top, but I think some people can't see that. Ooh, okay, so this is quite a mix. I'll give it uh, another 10 seconds for everyone to answer. Okay, so slight fluctuation still, but in the interest of time, I'm gonna move on if I can find my cursor. So the majority have gone with one liter over five hours, followed closely by one liter over 10 hours. So remember I said we replace, uh, according to the guidelines, 50% of the hourly losses. So what that means in this case is, so this patient is losing 200 mils an hour. We need to replace 50% of that. So 100 mils an hour, and that works out to one liter over 10 hours. So it was option C that was correct, which was the second most common. So not one liter over five hours, it's one liter over 10 hours because we replace 50% of the hourly losses uh, according to the NICE guidelines. So yeah. As an F1 and ED, make sure you've done all of these things, make sure you've written them up for fluids and urology will be very happy with you. All right, any questions, please ask. I'm going to be moving quite swiftly on just to make sure we get to the end, but please ask questions, I'm more than happy to answer. So just to summarize, acute urinary retention is a urological emergency. Um, it can cause a lot of damage and irreversible damage to the kidneys if not treated and as well as the patient being in extreme amounts of pain. Immediate management is all around relieving the pain and relieving the pressure on the kidneys, but definitive management is to treat the underlying cause. We've discussed causes, so stop the drugs, um, consider um, BPH treatment, which is of um, some drugs. I'm mainly concentrating on the emergencies here, so I'm not going to go into all the management for all of urology, but things like tamsulosin, finasteride, uh, obviously, if it's a malignancy, we need to think about whether it's treatable. If it's constipation, relieve the constipation and so on, because otherwise this will just keep happening again and again. All right, case study two, you are a GP this time, so not an ED, working in a clinic. Your 68-year-old male patient complains of blood in his urine for the last 10 days or so. So what are the causes of hematuria, which is blood in the urine? So hematuria, a two day, a, a sort of a day or two after putting in a catheter is, um, wait, have I understood the question? So what did you say the name of the condition was where we get hematuria when doing the catheter? Yeah, so you, you can have um, traumatic hematuria if the hematuria begins soon after the catheter. If it's already there at baseline, we need to think about what else is going on, such as all these causes that people are typing up now. Again, I know some people have just joined. I'll just keep typing in the username on the chat every now and then to make sure everyone gets a chance. I can see lots of things coming in through the chat as well. Cool. 
Cool, so malignancy, infection, bladder cancer, stones, palinephritis, trauma, malignancy, UTIs, uh, AAA, mm -hmm. malignancy, prostate cancer, good. Nephritic syndrome in the chat, very good. Um, don't forget medical causes, um, whether you're a surgical F1, whether you're in a surgical teaching, or whether a surgeon is, is interrogating you, always remember your medical causes as well, that's really good. Cool, and blood thinners, fantastic. All right, let's move on. You guys have covered literally everything. Again, can't emphasize enough, always have a system. So this is a system I use sometimes at medical school, the surgical sieve. So going down, it spells vitamin, yeah, vitamin C, uh, which is vascular, iatrogenic, trauma, and, there, and so on. You can see the causes within each of those things. So ones I want to point out are iatrogenic. So things like traumatic catheterization or previous instrumentation, drugs. Really glad some of you mentioned blood thinners. That's actually really common. Um, and a really common reason um, juniors might call the urology team from different wards. But if you just go back to the medications, you can see there might be a cause there. That doesn't mean that it should blind you from any other causes, um, especially things like malignancy. But definitely one thing you can do as an F1 is to cross off any blood thinners for a couple of days. Trauma, always people mentioned infection. So UTIs, pyelonephritis, glomic. Glom I can't say that, Glom oh my god, glomerulonephritis, <laughs> haven't said that in a while, and neoplastic things, so common things are bladder cancers and renal cancers. Um, crucially, they are usually painless, hematuria rather than painful. So before putting in a catheter, should you ask the patient if they are on blood thinners and does that affect how you proceed? No, so being on blood thinners is not a contraindication to um, being catheterized. Um, so no, no, you should ask them, of course, um, what medications they're on, but you can still catheterize them um, even if they're on blood thinners. In terms of further management they might need uh, on the wards and things, they might need to be held. So a very important thing to mention to the urologist um, if and when you call them, but you can catheterize them fine, that's, that's no problem. So hopefully all this makes sense. So this is one way of categorization for hematuria. I prefer anat anatomical categorization because like I said, I like visualizing the whole tube and working out what causes down that whole tube could be causing bleeding. We can see in this picture, kidney tumors, um, kidney inflammation, tumor along anywhere really in the, in the whole tract, bladder things like cystitis, the prostitis, uh, prostate as well. Uh, and within the urethra as well. So why does polycystic kidney disease cause hematuria? So uh, if you look at this anatomical picture, you can see here there's like an area of kidney scarring. So all those cysts can essentially cause some scarring, some inflammation in the kidney that can then cause some sort of microvascular um, tears, a little bit of bleeding, and then it might pass out the urinary tract. Not a very common cause. I'm sure people with, I don't think people with P polycystic kidneys present with hematuria but um, something to consider. So what are some important questions to ask in the history with this patient in front of you in GP? Great unintentional weight loss, really important question. I think in all of medicine, I think it's one of the most important questions. Painless or painful, brilliant, great. That was my top one. I would want you guys to remember. Medication history, fab. Good, so painful, painless, clots, um, uh, abdominal plank pain, B symptoms. What I mean by B symptoms are the weight loss, fever and night sweats, which may indicate malignancy. Um, so yes, someone said systemic features as well. Anticoagulation and smoking history. Yes, yeah, someone's also mentioned that in the chat. Why smoking history? and occupation. Why those two things specifically? Yep, exactly. Transitional cell carcinoma, um, big risk factor is smoking and with occupation dies. Great, you guys are on it. What investigations would you do as a GP? So you're not in the hospital? Yes, dipstick in capitals. <laughs> 
Yeah, so B symptoms um, were first described specifically with heme malignancy, so um, B cell lymphoma, but that triad um, are seen in lots of malignancies. So B symptoms have become sort of a, a quick phrase to summarize all your systemic features of malignancy. But yes, they originated with B cell lymphoma. Yes, all the stuff on the chat is correct in terms of your GP investigations, urine dip, MCNS, bloods. Yes, I think it would be reasonable to do a prostate exam as well in this age, in this demographic. And it's an easy thing to rule out. Okay, palpate for bladder, yep. Yeah. So um, you'll be able to feel the bladder, they are obviously in retention. So blood tests, this is the same patient. Blood tests show a raised white cell count. How would you manage this patient? In the brackets is just to remind you what this patient, what you know so far. So how would you manage it? You are the GP. Okay, bit of a spread again. So um, I studied at UCL and they were very, very keen that we learn the two week wait criteria. Uh, I think it's a good thing to know as well if you're doing any primary care placements. So <laughs> that's pushed up the two week wait answers a little bit, probably given a bit of a clue. So this would come under the NICE guidelines for two week wait criteria. Um, there are two week wait criteria for all sorts of symptoms, uh, all sorts of specialities, and hematuria is one of them. I find them a little bit strange. So essentially unexplained visible hematuria, uh, and it can't be put down obviously to a UTI, I think is a red flag. For some reason they've specified in the over 60s that there should be dysuria and a high white cell count. I checked this again today in case it's changed, but it's still the same. I'm not sure why it's and dysuria or raised white cell count. Realistically, the GP is going to refer anyone with um, a visible hematuria that doesn't have a UTI, uh, especially if it's painless um, on the onset, because it's a red flag for malignancy as we've discussed, okay? So either an explained hematuria or visible hematuria persisting, after UTI treatment uh, is a red flag and warrants two-week wait referral. And so this gentleman would come under that criteria. So where do these patients get referred? So anyone with hematuria will go to this one-stop clinic. They're mainly based in hospitals. And it's one-stop because the point of them is at the end, the patient has a diagnosis. And as you can probably um, empathize, if you're passing blood in your urine, it's quite scary, it can be very worrying, and it's important for their well-being to get answers quick, but also to, to plan the treatment and plan the management, okay? So one-stop clinic is made up of three things. It's the consultation, so the history and exam. Um, I will send the slides at the end of this. I think people are asking to go back, but just in the interest of time, I'll keep going if that's okay. Um, so yeah, consultation. Uh, history and exam, investigations, so all the ones you guys mentioned, but the most key thing about the one-stop clinic is this is where the cystoscopies happen. And if you guys are doing urology placements or in the hospitals um, on placement, I would definitely um, recommend going to cystoscopy lists. They'll get you really involved with the camera and everything, but also it's just a really, again, satisfying diagnostic test. It's like a catheter, but a lot thicker and with a camera on the end and it basically passes through the urethra into the bladder and you get a good look around the bladder to see if there's any bladder cancers. I've included a picture here. So usually the bladder walls are nice and smooth, but this horrible bit of fluffy stuff is a tumor, uh, which needs taken care of basically. So this is a really important thing that happens in, in the one-stop clinic. We could also consider imaging. 
um, such as a CT urogram. So remember the anatomical image I showed you for causes of hematuria? If we're not able to see something on the cystoscopy, aka nothing in the bladder, we need to think if it is it coming higher up. And a CT urogram is another word for a CT contrast, which will basically image the whole upper urinary tract to see if the cause of, uh, cause of hematuria is identified there. We'll talk about imaging shortly. Is there ever time we won't do CT urogram for a patient? Well, CT urogram uses contrast at very, very, very low renal functions. Contrast is contraindicated, so not for those patients. If the cystoscopy has diagnosed a cancer like the one you see in the picture, we found the cause for hematuria and we know what the treatment is. We don't necessarily need to um, image the whole upper urinary tract. Although depending on the location, if it's sort of quite close to the um, ureters, you might want to see if it's spread back or if it seeds backwards. But essentially, if you've not got a cause through cystoscopy, I would go for a CT urogram next. Uh, urine dipstick is really important. Before you do the cystoscopy, you'll see in the cystoscopy clinics, they do it for every patient because if they are infected, you don't want to spread the infection even further with all of these, um, with this cystoscopy. So, indication to send a patient to hospital immediately uh, would be things like hemodynamic instability. So if the blood loss is so great that the patient's blood pressure is dropping, heart rate is increasing, and don't underestimate hematuria, it can, it can be that bad that it actually affects the patient sy systemically, um, especially when they're passing big clots, and post-hematuria urinary retention. So that's what we were talking about earlier. If the patients come in with, you know, I've had hematuria, you know, yesterday and the day before and the day before, and now I can't pass any urine at all, this is a serious um, red flag for clot retention, which we'll talk about now. So how does the management of clot retention differ to acute urinary retention? There is a clue on the slides, but if anyone knows what these things are. Mm -hmm. Bladder irrigation is part of the treatment. Yep, different type of catheter is needed, okay? Uh, Three-way catheter, good. So on the left here is a two-way catheter, your normal Foley catheter. We've got two ports. One is for the urine to pass out, and the other, I'm not sure if you guys can see my cursor, but essentially the one with the writing is where the urine's coming out, and the one with this purple tip is where you blow up the balloon and um, this balloon blows up down here, and oh great, you can see the cursor, uh, and will prevent the catheter from falling out. On the right, we have a three-way catheter. It's called a three-way catheter because you've got three ports here instead of two. Two are the same, so one is for blowing up the balloon, uh, and one is for the urine to drain out, but crucially, there is a third one. I think uh, in this one, it is the middle one. I might be wrong. It's not too important, but the third one is the extra one that allows you to do irrigation and wash out. Someone's asked the difference between the two. I'll show you in a picture shortly. So this third, um, this third port is really important because it allows you to do those things. Another really important difference is, maybe you can appreciate from the picture, the three-way catheter is a lot thicker. And if you ever get to feel one, it's very rigid. Now that's because when you, when you are irrigating or doing washouts, in other words, putting loads of fluid in and taking loads of fluid out to wash out the whole bladder, um, the catheter needs to be able to withstand that pressure when you pull out all the fluid really quickly. And a Foley catheter, once you pull out fluid, would just collapse in on itself and actually just obstruct. But this three-way catheter can withstand these high pressures to allow this washout to happen. So like I said, in this image, I'm not too sure. In, in, um, when you get your hands on one, it actually says irrigate on the, on the irrigation one. I think it's the middle one because that looks like the biggest, which and it usually is the biggest. So I think this red one is to blow up the balloon. The small one is for the urine to pass out. And this big one in the middle is for the washouts. 
I might be wrong, uh, it's not too important, just know that there's three and look out for the word irrigate uh, if you have to use one of these in the hospitals. So clot retention is another urological emergency. It's basically what it says, when a blood clot is physically obstructing the outflow of urine, you need to know all of these things for management. There are two, um, what's the word? There are two objectives of the management. Number one is to relieve the obstruction. And number two is to prevent further clot formation. So if you guys can think back to the clotting cascade back way back in preclinical land, you might remember that essentially when a clot forms, it triggers the clotting cascade more and more clots form. So uh, one of the disasters that can happen is the clot retention, the clot is not cleared and more and more clots just begin to form and this obstruction becomes more and more severe. And that is where irrigation comes in because when you are flushing all this water through the urinary system, you are breaking up these clots um, and getting rid of them to prevent more clots forming. So here is a picture of what is happening when you're irrigating. So when you have irrigation, you put up this bag of fluid up here, the irrigation bag, usually just saline. It goes in, as you can see, gravity is on your side. So it's going in with quite a lot of pressure as it falls down. It goes in through the, three, the third port, goes into the urinary system, washes around the bladder and the urinary tract, and then comes back out and is collected and drained into the catheter. And you can keep this irrigation on and it's just continuously going in and coming out, going in and coming out. And that is irrigation. Uh, and that achieves what the objectives of the management are. Bladder washout, someone asked, it's quite similar. Essentially, you get a big bladder syringe. You fill it up with tons of saline. You use that third port and basically pump it in. Uh, and then you move the catheter around, basically, trying to get all that fluid to swirl around the bladder. And then you pull all that fluid out again. When you look at it in the bladder syringe, it will have blood, it will have clots. You get rid of it. And then you just do that again. Fill it up with saline again. Um, eject it into the bladder, let it wash out, pull it out. And you just keep doing that essentially until your water becomes a lot more clearer um, and with less clots in it. It's sort of a manual irrigation. Irrigation, you can just set up and let it run, you know, overnight, over hours. Bladder washout, you can do a bit more acutely with the patient in front of you just to get all those clots and things out and to get the catheter draining. Okay, you don't do it under local, actually. You just, you just do it. Um, it's not very comfortable for the patient, but especially if they're in retention beforehand, they'll be very grateful that you've gotten those clots out. Okay, so three-way irrigation catheter, IV access, which bloods are really important to get from this patient. Anyone? Yes, coagulation. If their iron is sort of five, then you need to do something about it to stop the hematuria. Yes, renal function for sure. One more really important thing to do if any patient in front of you is losing blood. Yes, group and save cross match. Yes, full blood count, of course, to see if they are anemic. But yes, group and save cross match. Like I said, don't underestimate how much blood can be lost through hematuria. These patients do sometimes need transfusions. Um, on my urology job, there were quite a few that needed transfusions. If the blood bleeding is not stopping, then we move on to cystoscopy, which is what I showed you earlier. What I showed you earlier is called a flexible cystoscopy, the ones to look for cancers and things. Rigid cystoscopy is obviously a rigid form. It's a lot chunkier and it's done in theater under GA. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's sort of like the next step up. It can offer a much more comprehensive washout. Uh, okay, so a couple of questions. What causes clot formation? So again, think back to the clotting cascade. If you are bleeding, then your body forms clots. Okay, so if you're bleeding from anticoagulation, from trauma, from uh, malignancy, you'll be bleeding for a while and your body will start to form clots as a way to protect you, as it should but then it leads to these problems. So yeah, the clotting cascade is the short answer to that. 
risk factors for clot retention is essentially just hematuria. Um, I can't think why someone would be more likely to clot than others, apart from if their INR is really, really low um, for whatever reason. But otherwise, it, it commonly happens in hematuria, um, especially if they're bleeding quite heavily. Bleeding disorders, yes, of course, if they've got thrombophilia, um, so things that cause more clotting. And the difference between group and save and cross match, good question. Group and save is where you essentially um, take the patient's blood sample and put it on the database and find out what it is, so what type they are. Cross match is actually when you do the reactions with the, um, the antibodies and see what sticks. And that is what actually gives you the um, blood products ready to give the patient. Okay, that takes a lot longer time. Having the group and save is a lot quicker and you can get your blood products you need. Cross match takes a lot longer, but it's sort of like the second level of confirming what blood type they are. And it's something you might have to wait for it to happen, but group and save lets that happen a lot quicker and gives you blood in emergency situations, if that makes sense. Yes, always, yeah, always do um, group and save. Uh, if someone's bleeding in front of you. It's better that you have that blood type on record um, than not. Okay, any other questions, let them come through. I'm gonna move on. Case study three. So as a urology FY1 on call, you are called to a &E to assess a 37 year old woman with a six hour history of severe right flank pain. What are your differentials? I'll put the username in the chat again. Guys just joining or joined recently, um, poll Ev on your phone or your browser, and that's the username. Also feel free to put on the chat as well. Cool, pyelonephritis, fab. So sometimes when I ask this question, everyone's just in urology world and forgets about everything else. Um, your patient won't come to you in a &E saying, hello, I'm a urology patient. You need to have your Y differentials and with females, there's a whole nother, another category to think about. So good, ectopics, pyelonephritis, yes, renal colic. Uh, don't think this female, oh, torsion. Oh, okay, yeah, ovarian torsion, yeah. I thought of testicular torsion straight away, but yes. Ovarian torsion. Mm -hmm. Good. Yes, yes, yes. All wonderful things to think about. So if we can just move on. Yes, I haven't got a, um, I haven't broken this out down into categories, sadly, as much as I love categorization. Um, but again, have some sort of system for going through your pace, your causes of acute abdomen. Okay, so this is an acute abdomen. And um, given, sorry, the brief in the corner um, is the wrong one. This is still the same brief of the 37 year old woman with abdominal pain, right sided. Um, here are just some causes. You guys mentioned most of them. So gynecological causes and urological causes, of course. Remember your general surgery GI causes. So appendicitis, perforation, cholecystitis, especially when we're talking about the right side. Don't forget about those things as well. Okay. Why would cholecystitis present with flank pain? Not necessarily. Um, would not, it wouldn't necessarily be flank pain. Um, obviously with flank specifically, we're thinking more about the kidneys for obvious reasons, um, but cholecystitis could still present with pain. As you know, the gallbladder can inflame, it can rub onto the diaphragm, it can cause pains in the shoulder, it can cause pains in the back. So yeah, probably not my top differential. I put these in a random order, um, but it's just something to consider if we're talking about right-sided pain. Cool, so immediate management, anyone? Yep, 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 perfect, cool. So examination A to E and all the history and bedside investigations we've spoken about. Um, I've underlined their pregnancy test. I don't think any females go through A&E without a pregnancy test, to be honest. 
um, no matter what they present with, just because it affects so many things, like if they need imaging or anything further down the line. And yes, to the very nice people who've offered some pain control, that would be very nice. So this person in front of you, we've got lots of differentials like renal colic, like pyelonephritis, like appendicitis. Um, how, how could you determine which one it is even before you get to the patient? How would a patient with pyelonephritis or renal colic be different to the patient with appendicitis? Even before you get to the patient, what kind of things would you be able to see? Yeah, totally. Yeah, good. So when we're talking about renal issues, yes, fever and examination will help. But I, I mean, even before you get to the patient, if they are writhing around, pacing up and down, that's a really good clue that this patient is probably not peritonitic and they've probably got things like renal colic, renal stone, it's excruciating pain, patient can't sit still. Something like a ruptured ectopic appendicitis, which can cause um, peritonism, the patient will not be moving, not even a, a millimeter, because they do not want to move anything in their abdomen because of the pain it causes. So I think that's a really good end of the bed test um, that you can do when you're going into A&E. So here are your findings, um, here are your observations, your main points from your A to E, and the uh, examination. Most of the pain is on the flank, but you also notice it's going sort of from up here, down here into the groin as well. Um, hopefully everyone can read all of that. So what is the most likely diagnosis? Yep, so it could be a simple UTI. It could be a nasty UTI, which has got developed into pyelonephritis. We're still thinking about renal colic, renal stones, good. I think the main thing to note here is this patient is pyrexial and in pain, and they've got this urine dip, okay? So there's definitely some sort of infective process going on here, most likely to do with the kidneys and, um, yeah, this patient's basically quite unwell, okay? So one of the, mo it could just be pyelonephritis from a UTI. It could also be pyelonephritis caused by a renal stone. So pyelonephritis is basically just upper urinary tract infection and inflammation. Um, it, it means the patient is very sick. And uh, basically one take home message is an infected obstructed kidney is a urological emergency okay for now we know they're infected we're not sure if they're obstructed but this is something you need to rule out if this patient is in front of you okay they're clearly infected they've clearly got something like pyelonephritis is it just pyelonephritis caused by an upward progression of a uti or is there some sort of obstruction in the tract causing stasis of the urine causing localized inflammation and infection, which is spread and flared up the whole urinary tract. Okay, that's what we need to think about. But if it is obstructed, you need to know ASAP. Okay, so what imaging would you request? So this is a 37 year old female. The pregnancy test is negative. They have got this loin to groin pain, hematuria and infective markers on the urine dip and they're pacing up and down. So what are we thinking? Uh, good question. This is, this is definitive um, imaging. Uh, yeah. Bro, so clear, um, clear majority here. Imaging always, um, I always found quite confusing in urology when you use contrast, when you don't, et cetera, et cetera. So we will talk about this, but yes, a CTKUB non-contrast is um, the gold standard for diagnosing renal stones. 
So if we just have a look at what that looks like. No, nope, haven't got what that looks like until the next slide. But yes, essentially a CTKUB is what you need. If you wanna, that's where you see the stones. If a patient like this in my hospital, if a patient like this comes to the A&E department and I'm suspecting stones, I cannot make a referral to urology until I've got the CTKUB um, confirming the stone. If it's not a stone and it's just a simple, I say simple pyelonephritis is obviously quite, um, quite intense, but if it's just pyelonephritis without a stone, so non-obstructive sepsis, it's not surgical and it goes to the medics. I think this is common in most hospitals. If it is obstructed, it goes straight to the urology surgeons and it's an emergency for them to handle, okay? So in a and &E, I would get a CTKUB if I had a high suspicion of stones as we do for this scenario, okay? So just a quick sort of at a glance for imaging. It's mainly dependent on your suspicion and your clinical suspicion and the symptoms. If you're suspecting renal stones, so colicky pain, relieved by NSAID, someone mentioned um, an NSAID earlier on the chat, you're getting a CTKUB, it's the gold standard and it shows you stones as we'll see. If you're suspecting pyelonephritis, so you're not really having this sort of colicky, very, very typical stone kind of pain, then a renal ultrasound is probably best at the beginning um, to see if this patient's got hydronephrosis. And then you could maybe think about looking for stones. I, given the way hospitals work and given the way that you need to decide whether this is going to the medics or the surgeons, I would go with a CTKUB first, unless there's any obvious contraindications, um, such as pregnancy, for example. So I would stick with CTKUB. If you're suspecting malignancy, so now we're looking more at the hematuria, not really infective or anything, that's when the CT with contrast, which is confusingly also called an IV urogram, um, comes in. The contrast is what lights up the malignancy, uh, and that gives you the best view of malignancy. Um, Non-contrast is best for stones. The stones will show up as white, so you can see bilaterally. In both of these images, we've got a really big stone here on the first image. Um, something there as well. And in this one, we've got some stones in the kidneys, but also some small ones in the ureters as well, okay? So this is vital if you are wanting to refer to urology. And obviously it's vital for defining their management. So I would go with CTKUB if possible. Okay, what's the single best option to manage this person's pain? Hopefully quite straightforward. Or rather it's one of those things that, you know, when you know, you know. <laughs> Cool, so I can see diclofenac is getting ahead there. So urologists have actually told me that PR, if, what's the word, renal pain um, resolving with PR diclofenac is almost diagnostic of renal stones itself. That's how good it is for renal stones, okay? I don't know why it's PR rather than I am. You know, I wouldn't want to be giving patients PR things if I can avoid it. It's not very, um, not a lot of dignity there but they will be thankful in, in the long run. I'm not sure why it's PR. It must be some sort of bioavailability or effect on the renal urinary tract specifically, I'm not sure. Um, but yes, PR diclofenac stat um, sorts these patients out a lot, okay? And these patients will be in a lot of pain. So they'll be very thankful to get something that will help them. Obviously use the pain ladder, add things as well if they need but um, PR diclofenac is a great place to start, okay? So how would you manage this in a and &E? I'm just going to kind of storm ahead just to get through. So this patient is septic. Remember, you are the F1, you are not the urologist. You need to be safe and competent dealing with emergencies like this. This is a septic patient. So therefore the whole works, the fluids, the cultures, the IV antibiotics, according to whatever the local guidelines are, analgesia, and contact urology very urgently, okay? So it's very, very, this is a big emergency. This is something a consultant would wake up for in the middle of the night kind of emergency um, because these patients can become extremely septic, extremely unwell very quickly. And this obstruction needs to be relieved, okay? 
There are two ways to relieve the obstruction on the kidney. That's either a nephrostomy or a ureteric stent. We'll look at both of those things briefly. You don't need to know much about them. Renal stones, um, this is just a table on um, FASMED. Not gonna spend too long on it really. Just know that common places for stones to be are the ureteropelvic junction and the ureterovesicle jun junction, sometimes called PUJ um, junction, because there's obviously an anatomical um, kind of dip there. So it's quite easy for a stone to lodge. Most common ones are calcium oxalate um, up here. Uh, yeah, this is just sort of facts to learn. Nothing really that you need to know uh, from a management point of view from an F1 point of view. Uh, so hydronephrosis is basically when the um, di kidneys dilate because there's a downflow obstruction. We've already talked about one downflow obstruction, which could be urinary retention, causing back pressure and causing hydronephrosis on both sides. It could also, that would usually cause it on both sides, but one-sided can also happen. There's a mnemonic here called PACT. One of those things is a calculi as a stone, like we're talking about here. And it essentially demonstrates that the kidneys are under pressure and it could be causing damage to the kidneys if that obstruction is not relieved quickly, okay? So nephrostomy is what you see on the top. This is a tube that goes straight into the kidney and allows all that urine to drain to put to relieve the pressure and any urine the kidney produces will come out through that tube rather than getting clogged up um, around the stone. And another thing you can do is a ureteric stent. So that's a stent that's done under GA, usually put in similarly to a catheter, um, passed up into the bladder, into the ureter, and you can inject some dye in theater. And this dye will show up like this image to let you know that you're in the right place. Usually if this patient's a very septic, you're not gonna be going in trying to take the stone out or take the cancer out or whatever it is that's causing the malignancy. You just need to relieve this septic process. You need to relieve the obstruction. So you can put the stent in to allow urine to drain normally, or you can put this nephrostomy in to allow the urine to drain into a bag, sort of like a catheter bag that's sitting on your back usually. So except the antibiotics you give, got a couple of questions about this. They are always according to local policy guidelines, so it differs in every hospital. Um, once you guys get to your hospital, there is an app called MicroGuide. You enter which hospital you're working in, you literally search for what you need, and it tells you what is given in that trust for that antibiotic. It varies um, between hospitals, okay? Uh, again, not going to spend too long on this because we're focusing on emergencies today, but ultimately further down the line in urology land, there will be different ways to manage renal stones. We can watch and wait if it's amenable to that. We can give some medications to relax the urinary tract and allow the stone to pass, or we could go at it with some lasers and various other bits and bobs to help actually break it down. This last box is the most important thing I wanna tell you about, and that is an obstructed infected kidney. They need admission, they need resuscitation, and they need drainage, okay? One take home message from that. Now I know we've pretty much reached the end of time. Um, so I'm going to blast through this case. This is a really quick one anyway, but it's just got one take home message I want to make sure we discuss before we leave. So this is an F1 in A&E with intense testicular pain that began around two hours ago. Any differentials? Just quick fire on the chat. Yes. Yep, good. Everyone's, the torsion alarms are going off for everyone, but remember other things too. Epididymorchitis, great. Mumps, yes. Weirdly, I had about four or five patients with mumps on the ward when I was on urology. I thought it was it was over, but clearly not. Epididymitis, epididymorchitis, yes, pretty much the same thing. Cool. So we've got all our testicular things, torsion epididymorchitis. Now this patient uh, has got pain rather than a lump, but don't forget things like hydrocele, varicoceles, and um, tumors. 
Fournier's gangrene is essentially necrotizing fasciitis of the perineal region. Quite rare, but I have seen it once in the UK and quite a few times on my elective actually. Um, hernias, and also remember the loin to groin pain that comes with renal pathology. This could be a presentation of further up pathology like renal colic and stones. It could also be a presentation of any abdominal pathology. Sometimes men would have testicular pain before they begin to develop an acute abdomen. So when they have abdominal pain, make sure you look at the testicles. And if they're having testicular pain, make sure you examine the abdomen as well, because they can present as each other, if that makes sense sometimes. Questions to ask in the history. I know someone mentioned STIs in the chat. That's a really good thing to do because those, um, those organisms can cause epididymokitis in the younger population. Timeline is really important, both for trying to identify your pathologies, but also because time is really of the essence when this patient is in front of you. Trauma can often precede torsion. Usually someone's been hit either in sports or a fight or something. And then hours later, they develop this severe pain. And associated symptoms are important too. So um, how would you manage this patient? And all the information you know is all I've given you. This is a young man with testicular pain. I think I said it was going on for a few hours. Okay, this is a good split. This is the usual split. This is the usual point of contention. So do we go straight to urology or do we do some investigations first? In this case, without doubt, it is an urgent urological review. And essentially an acute painful swollen testes in a boy or young adult is torsion until proven otherwise. You do not wait to get an ultrasound. In fact, in my hospital, if you put in your request that you're querying torsion, the ultrasound will be cancelled because the radiologists say, well, the management for this suspicion is exploration in theatre. So you, we're not doing we're not doing the ultrasound. OK, and they're right, to be honest, because this time is of the essence. Like I said, you have from onset six hours until this testicle will die. And obviously the implications, especially for a young man, are huge. So you really want to avoid that under all costs. It's better to go to theater to A, diagnose the torsion and then B, treat it. You don't, want to, you don't necessarily wait for di um, a diagnosis before you go to theater, okay? So straight to urology, it will probably take them straight to theater, okay? Uh, these are your two main differentials when it comes to painful testicles. I've included some differences to look out for between the two. Um, I will send these slides around so you can look at this a bit more carefully. Essentially, testicular torsion is a lot more sudden, more associated with trauma. In younger patients, they may also have this anatomical abnormality called a bell clapper deformity. And epididymokitis is more gradual. They may have symptoms of STIs. They may have a previous history of STI. Um, it can also be caused by mumps, which is rare, but not completely gone. Um, so these are things that will lean you towards one or another. But if any doubt, straight to urology and straight to theatre. A bell clapper deformity is essentially an anatomical abnormality where this um, spermatic cord, if you can see in the second picture, more, more of it dangles into the tunica vaginalis. Because there's more there, there's more that can twist. Um, and when the testicle twist, twist, that's a testicular torsion. The blood supply is cut off to the testicle. If that's cut off for too long, that's what causes irreversible death of the testicle. That's what testicular torsion is, okay? So this is why it might present in um, young patients quite often because they're born with this deformity. Anyone know what you must consent the patient for if you are taking them in for exploration of their testes? 
this came up for me in my final year as an OSCE actually, about what you would consent the patient for. Yeah, sweet. So they may, ideally you're going to go in, untwist it and carry on with life. But if it's already dead by the time you get there, it could be removed. So you need to make sure the patient's aware of that. And yes, when we correct a torsion or remove a testicle, whichever outcome it is, at the same time we fix the contralateral one, a person who's meant to have, not meant to have, a person who has had one torsion, likely to have another, especially if they've got these, deform these anatomical deformities. We don't want it to happen again. We're in theatre, so we opportunistically fixate the other one as well, okay? So bilateral fixation and an orchidectomy is what you must consent for. Now that is everything. A few other urological emergencies, someone asked about phimosis, so inability to retract the foreskin. Paraphimosis is there's a lovely picture down here, which is inability to reduce it. These are both surgical, well paraphimosis more so is a surgical emergency because it can again cut off blood supply, uh, causing ischemia. Not going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, feel free to look at the slides. Uh, essentially, if you see anything like this, just call urology and just let them sort it out. Um, priapism is a persistent painful erection. Again, there are concerns about blood supply here and irreversible ischemia. So this is a urological um, emergency. Send to urology. Now, I know it is quarter past. I've got five SBA questions on Polev. Are people happy to go through them? maybe 30 seconds to one minute per question. I also have a night shift tonight, so I need to leave. So I won't, might not be able to explain them too much, okay? So 66 year old man has episodes of recurrent suprapubic pain with hematuria and dysuria. He describes poor urinary stream, difficulty initiating micturition and has to get up frequently in the night to void. What is the, uh, can't read, what is the single most likely diagnosis? going to be quite rapid with these so I'm going to give 10 more seconds obviously it could be any of these things the question is asking what is the single most likely diagnosis okay so that is key okay I'm going to move on or I'll just keep talking while people are answering if they wish so yes BPH is the correct answer this is all of your voiding symptoms. Do you remember the one with the nice mnemonic with the straining, hesitancy, terminal dribbling, etc.? This is very um, telling of a prostate problem. And the most common cause um, of the symptoms is BPH rather than prostate cancer. So prostate cancer is not an option here, probably because it'll be a bit confusing, but BPH is more common than prostate cancer, okay? It's pretty much a rite of passage for men when they get to this age. I don't know why evolution did that. Okay. 67 year old man presents with frank, painless frank hematuria. Ooh, some of it's cut off. He also complains of mild right-sided testicular ache. Hopefully you can read it on your phone, if not on my screen. He is cachectic and his right testicle appears tortuous. Which imaging modality would be most suitable for diagnosis of the most likely pathology? So lots of key words here. I've tried to emphasize them, but try and emphasize them in your head as well to help you answer the question. Where does the blood come from? So in BPH, uh, essentially, the, obviously the prostate is growing around the urethra. That can can cause some localized inflammation, which can cause some localized hematuria. It's not, it's not totally uncommon, um, but it's not the commonest um, presentation of BPH either. But um, yeah, def definitely see it um, a fair amount. All right, CTKUB and a CT with contrast. This is why I find urology imaging so confusing. So CTKUB is the same as a CT of the urinary tract without contrast. That should have said, the second option should have been CT urinary tract with contrast. Hopefully you um, 
will gather that I'm talking about the urinary tract here. So right-sided testicular um, tortuousness, most likely a right-sided varicocele. This is a red flag for what kind of cancer? Anyone quickly answer on the chat? Yes. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, so this is a red flag for renal cancer. With cancers, we want CT with contrast because the contrast lights up the malignancy. And why is this a red flag for cancer? Well, like I said right at the beginning, if we look at anatomy, it explains everything. So the venous supply to the testicles is through the testicular vein. On the right side, the testicular vein goes straight into the IVC. On the left side, it enters at this right angle into the renal vein. If you can see this perpendicular right angle on the left side. Blood flow is going to be difficult when there's a right angle and it's likely to cause some sort of, it, it, not likely, but it, it's, it's not, uh, I can't speak. If it causes some backflow issues, it's not the most crazy thing because it's so perpendicular that um, it can cause this tortuosity. On the right side, it's not really any reason for varicoceles to form because it's got a much better drainage system. It's not at that sharp right angle. So left-sided varicoceles are very common. Not very common, but more common. Right-sided varicoceles are not as common because the anatomy lends itself to better drainage. And so if you're seeing a right-sided varicocele, it's likely there's a malignancy further up causing this obstruction. And so you want to look into a right-sided renal cancer. Okay, moving on, I'm just gonna get through. So 62 year old man presents with malaise. His blood tests are as follows. Okay, nope, they are not as follows. Which of these medications can be continued? Essentially, he's got a creatinine rise from 75 to 170 uh, and a slight urea rise, everything else is normal. Note the question says, which of these medications can be continued? Okay, so remember the um, mnemonic, stop the damn drugs. Dam includes all of these medications apart from, I think confusingly, amlodipine. Amlodipine is not a nephrotoxic medication. You can continue it when a patient is in AKI. Um, so amlodipine is the right answer. All of the others come under nephrotoxic drugs, including digoxin, yes. Oh, now you can see the blood's great. Okay, I think we're almost there, guys. Two more questions. 46-year-old woman presents with searing back pain radiating from loin to groin, and she cannot keep still. She's had several recent UTIs. She's found to have a struvite urolipid Lithiasis, lithiasis, can't say that word before. What is the most likely causative organism? This is one of those just SBA, you know, the table I showed you from past med. You just have to learn certain facts from it. This is one of them. All right, lovely, we've got a nice majority here. So yes, Proteus is a common uh, organism that causes struvite um, renal stones. Struvite renal stones basically take up the shape of the whole renal pelvis. They're quite scary actually. Um, yeah, if you, if you look up pictures of things of them, you can see just how big they are and they essentially form in the whole renal pelvis. They're very big and a patient's probably contaminated with an organism like Proteus. So yeah, just learn that table for these fun facts they like in SBAs. And last question, this was in my, well, quite a few of these were in my finals actually. This is one of them that caused everyone a lot of stress. So you're an FY1 on urology, you feel a testicular mass on one of your patients. You write a management plan that includes investigations. This is exactly how it was phrased. Which one of these is your consultant most likely to cross off the list?
This is a young patient. Cap, sorry, is a CT chest, abdo, pelvis, essentially a full body CT scan. Again, it's which one of these is the most likely to be crossed off the list. Okay, yep, quite a spread. I think it was probably the same when it was in our final year paper as well. Uh, probably a similar spread because it is a tough question, but I thought it was an interesting learning point. So the correct answer is transcutaneous biopsy, okay? And that is because uh, testicular cancer, which is what this question is getting at, can, um, can basically seed and spread into the rest of the body. So you do not want to be introducing needles uh, into this possible cancer, you would diagnose it with these other investigations, as well as, you know, of course, the history um, as well. So yes, a transcutaneous biopsy would be crossed off. There are a few cancers like that, liver cancers as well. We always try and avoid biopsy because of the risk of seeding. So usually in a question, um, biopsies will either be wrong or not very high up when it comes to liver and testicular cancers. Yep, like people have said in the chat, because it can cause seeding. Brilliant. That's everything.